<laughs> but I know you're busy, right? You don't really have the time to, you know, working out sometimes. Unfortunately, yeah, that's true. Because <laughs> I hear that, you know. And then、um, actually, before we like get into this like conversation, I want to ask you a question. It's an important question, not about mistakes, about other other stuff. So、mm -hmm. um, I watched a video. In 2016, you was in the Barnstable High School. Have a TED talk. It's called Joy. You remember that? And、mm -hmm. then, and on you like embody a lot of like point. Like you gotta feel like feel joy in everything when you when you do this one. For example, when you eat a pizza, don't just eat a pizza. When you are playing an instrument, don't just play. You gotta feel it. So my question is like, so if I don't like math. If I don't like some of the subject, but I'm how can I? I sometimes I try my best. Like I try to love this, you know. I like this place, you know. I try to do my best, but I can't. So how can I figure it out? This kind of question. Well, and this relates to what we're going to be talking about today. Is that never assume anything. Never assume. That the way the world is, and that the way that your parents tell you, and the way that your teachers tell you, or the way that the world tells you has to be, has to be that way. And so much guilt, and you know, we'll talk about this in, in the thing. But so much guilt is based around, especially when you're young, but even when you're older, not fitting in. So, if you're Asian, and all your Asian friends love math, and you're told by your parents and your, but you know, or you know, especially your parents, that you know you need to be really good so you can get a good job. These are things that are external, and so if you don't like math or history. It's not always you. If you're a good person, if you have a good heart, which I think you are, I do have one. Okay, then that is fantastic. That is having a good heart is more important than having a high SAT score or having、um, perfect grades or the Respect and laud the love of your schoolmates. Being a good person is more rare and more valuable than any of that. So, if you don't, let's say you know, if you don't love something and you don't have a joy for it, that's okay. What's more important than having a joy for math is having a joy for life. And having a joy for yourself. There's no use of having a joy for math, but not loving yourself. And there are some people, yeah, okay. There are some people who love math, and there are some people who love boba. And you know, we're all different. We're all different people. I think that's the first thing I would say, Henry, is don't question yourself if you don't love something. Because no one can love everything, but what is the most important when the day is done is that you love life and you love yourself. Does that make sense? That makes sense. That makes sense. And, and then if you know, let's say you know, people say, "Oh, you should do better at," you should do better at.、Um, School, or you should do better at sports, or you should do better at whatever, and then you're asking yourself, why don't I love it more? Why aren't I better at it? It's a. That's the that's the wrong way to look at things.、And、there's nothing, and and let me say one more thing is that sometimes the issue is it and and being a teacher, I've been a teacher for a very very long time, for a very very long time. I know that the majority of time, when a student is isn't in love with something, 
the answers are inside of me as a teacher, not inside the student. The student, it's easy for a teacher to make, or, or a class, or a school, make the student feel like it's their fault. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, especially during this time of pandemic, and I've been part of so many faculty meetings, and I've talked to so many teachers, we rarely, if ever, ask ourselves, is the problem us and not the student? And I, and I think that if you look at how education is going over the last 100 years, that education is the way that we teach things. Never change. It's still in, in the caveman era. And if you just look at the way that we learn things on YouTube, we learn things so quickly now on YouTube. If we taught things in that way, younger people would learn things much more quickly and be more interesting. You, you know how you know how a good YouTube go, uh, looks. First, within a good YouTube that has like over a hundred thousand hits or a million hits, you know why it does. You can see how it's edited. You can see how the graphics are done. You can see how quickly things are made. You know a good YouTube video. When a class is not taught well, you can't compare it to other YouTube videos. You just have to sit in that class. So it's so if you don't love math, I, I'm here to tell you it may not because it's you. It may be because of that chemistry between you and that teacher and the way the teacher's presenting the material or the school's presenting the material. Because I can be and you. I could be interested in anything if the YouTube video is good. I could be interested in medieval history. I could be interested in Latin. I could be interested in how to cook a good pancake. Things that I wouldn't naturally think I was passionate about. But when you see someone on YouTube be passionate and quick and knowledgeable, then it's fun to learn. Mm -hmm. so, the, so don't ask, the first question is, why am I not joyful? What's wrong with me? That's usually not the right question. Wow. I do learn a lot from it. And actually, because uh, like when I was uh, in the middle school, like I don't like math at all. And then like in my class, I was like find a problem on the teacher. So I think, why don't you like make the class being more interesting rather than like this? You know, that's your problem, actually, because students are listening to your class. You're trying, you got to find a way to like make us right. like happy. Right. That's so Henry, you what you said is true some parents or teachers say don't talk like that but i think you're right but don't you know you're stuck in a system for now maybe in 20 years schools will be very very different but for now you're stuck in the system i want you when you go out into the world and if you ever teach someone anything else i want you to remember what you're saying right now and i want you to change the system wow <laughs> That's wow. <laughs> That's a, I mean, yeah, I can. Yeah, I, I, you know, I do have a big dream like that, you know, like want to change something, especially in this society. And um, wow, it's, you really like give me a lot of point. And then like I can think about the question, like uh, the joyful problem, actually. And then um, so why don't we get into the mistakes problem okay. right now? So, right. Um, so the first question I want to ask you is about um, uh, general mistakes. Like, so general question actually is like, what are you thought about making new mistakes? Well, I'm sure when you talk to other people about this, we all say the same thing, is that two things. One is that the only way to learn is by making mistakes. If we, were, we came out of the womb when we were little babies, and we were afraid to make mistakes, we wouldn't learn anything. But the beautiful thing about being a baby and a child is that you, there is no judgment. You're so damn cute that everyone loves your mistakes. Oh, look at that, he fell down, you yes. know? And, and so as a child, as a very, very young child, you're very, it's very accepting and even rewarding to make mistakes as a child. 
But then there's a point where you get older and people get tired of your mistakes. And then they want, they, they label mistakes as bad. And so, you know, if you're learning your ABCs or if you're learning, you know, basic arithmetic, there is all of a sudden a expectation by teachers and tests to say, no, this way, this way, this way, this way. And while that's good, because obviously we have to learn how to use a fork and a spoon and we have to, you know, know what's dangerous and stay away from danger. It also has a negative effect that we don't talk about, yeah. which is fear, fear of making mistakes. And so this is something that we have to acknowledge that no parent is perfect and no teacher is perfect. And ideally a parent and a teacher will raise a child in a way that the child can both understand what to stay away from, but always have other doors open. Because when you teach a child to close doors, they, those doors often stay closed forever. You know, one of the things I often tell young people is that the most valuable thing, and we were talking about this a little while ago, the most valuable thing you have is your innocence. When you're young and become an adolescent, one of the first things you're, you're made fun of is your sense of innocence. Oh, you don't believe that, do you? You know, oh, be cool, be critical of everything. That's really a sign of being mature is that you hate everything. Don't be young and childlike. But if you look at the most successful people in it, that I, I have seen, you know, performers like, you know, Yo-Yo Ma or, you know, James Taylor and, and people that I've had the pleasure of working with, they are, there's a childlike quality to them. They're not childish, but it's a wonderment where there's, they respect people, they respect life, they, they, they are very present. They enjoy the moment like a child. When a child, you know, a child is very much like a pet. You have a dog or a cat, by any yeah, chance, I, or a dog? I a dog? Yeah, I used to have a dog. The thing that you notice about a dog is that they're very present all the time. They're sitting on your lap and they're enjoying it. They're not thinking, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow? They're just in that moment, enjoying that moment. And the same thing about a child. They're not worried about anything. They're just in the moment. If you can preserve that and not be worried, and that's where mistakes come into to, to play. Mistakes, um, the fear of making mistakes, the, it, mistakes aren't bad. The fear of making mistakes can be the most crippling thing. And I think it's, it, it makes the difference between an inventor mm -hmm. and someone who doesn't invent things. Someone who's a creator and someone who doesn't create things. It is the, between the, the, the billionaire and the person who is holding onto their dollar and never investing it. So it doesn't mean that all that, you know, you, 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 you shouldn't be wise or you shouldn't expand your consciousness and understand how to take a risk. There are good risks and bad risks. I mean, I'm not going to run across the freeway because it's a risk. But to, to, to be both wise and courageous and to open your heart. And that's really, it doesn't have so much to do with intelligence. It has to do with your heart. And, you know, every child is a potential, potential billionaire, potential president of the United States, potential genius. And I tell you, it can be killed, it can be destroyed in a minute or even a couple of months or years if that child is taught to fear making mistakes how so i don't really understand this one but i mean if they are fear about the mistake is that like could you like give me more you know i mean we all have heard stories and, and thankfully my parents weren't this way but heard stories of children coming home and being afraid to show their report card and that happens quite often and then the parent comes home, and you know, especially in Asian culture, where it's just 
this expectation for the child to excel. And if you don't get straight A's, then you are a failure. And that's a terrible message. I mean, I, those, of, those of us who have gone through strict parents and then we grow up to be success, we go, oh, look, being strict has made me a success. And, you know, or going through this school and they were tough on me has made me a success. I understand that. There's some people who are built with that, who, who, who enjoy pressure, enjoy judgment. Okay, you're built a certain way. But I've also met a lot of people who said, you know, my love of music, for example, because I'm a musician, um, there's a school that I taught at and they had something called challenges. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, Henry, but challenges is when one musician is pitted against another and then they're judged against each other and then one person has chose the winner and they move up in seating yeah, in the ensemble. And I've had many people come to me and say, you know what, I, I quit music because of that. Wow. Now, what's the price to pay? Sure, one person may be a winner and they feel built up and king of the world, but another person has learned to hate music. Is it worth the price of building up that one person to destroy beauty and love and joy for another person? I decided it wasn't. So while being taught that making mistakes is bad and you must be perfect and while that may build up one person is it worth training a whole culture and we've talked about you know it's been analyzed about let's say you know asian culture of uh, when you in 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 the old country versus america and and i i don't know if this is true in america anymore but people would say the thing that makes us different from other cultures is our innovation. When people come from Europe, come from Asia, oh, Americans are so open. That's what they always say. Oh, they're so open and they're so uh, gregarious and they're so um, uh, entrepreneurial and, and all this other stuff. But that's, that's slowly being taken away from us. And we're, you've heard the term teaching to the test? Yeah. We're becoming less a society of, of alternative thinking and more of teaching to the test. Even music is being taught to teach to the test. There's a right way and a wrong way. Now, anyone who is, a, is, is an experienced musician knows that you have to experiment because you're, you're changing, your emotions are changing, your brain is changing. You have to adjust to how the world is changing. You know, when I was growing up, there was no internet. <laughs> and people's you know it was mtv and people's attention span was getting smaller but now people's have a 10 second you know where, where they may have had a three minute attention span now people have a 10 second uh, uh, thing so i uh, as a musician have to experiment and change and find different ways i don't know i don't know why it took me a long time to overcome the fear of making mistakes i got to tell you i won't go through it right now but for a lot of it, it, and I started asking questions about who's right? Is the world right? What is a mistake? What is a mistake? Is it what someone else tells me or is it what I believe? And for a long time, mistakes I felt were defined by what my schools told me, what my teachers told me, what my, and, and, and that's all I cared about. All I cared about is what they thought. We don't give people enough time to just be quiet and just step. I wish that we can just turn the world off, put it on pause like a video, and then go take a year or a month or even a day and just experiment with our life, make all the mistakes that we want. Wouldn't that be great that we, if, we were, if we were 17 years old, we could put a, the world on pause and then travel for a year and make all the mistakes and never be afraid. Can you imagine never being afraid of making a mistake and then coming back and then picking up on our life? We would be so wise. We would be so wise, but we're always afraid of, of the unknown. And I, and I always say, you know, for a long time, I used to believe 
that the terrible thing was not uh, was what we don't know. But now I believe the, the worst thing, a worse thing is what we think we know. Meaning as we go through life, all those doors get closed. And so we think the world has only four walls to it or a car has only four tires to it. That's the way we think the world works. But it is the geniuses, it is the Steve Jobs and it is the, the, the people who, you know, the Albert Einsteins who see the world in a different way and envision it. And I, that's, that's the danger of mistakes. And, and that gets ingrained very, very early, like language. Yeah. You know, our first language is, is, our, is, is our, our, the way that we see the world. Even if we learn a second language, or the first language is the way we see the world. And learning to be fearful of mistakes is the way that we see the, the rest of uh, the world, the, the rest of our lives. Wow. You mentioned a lot of point actually, but um, I do, uh, I want to like note this, another point right here. So like, so the people, most of the people like, um, they, they're not to make mistakes because they want, they don't want to pay the consequences in it. So it, for example, if you're in, in like 30 years old, you're 40 years old, you're the pillar in your family, right? Like you, you can't, right? Like if you made a mistakes, your family cloths, the money gone, like, all the stuff like that. So, you know, how can we overcome that kind of stuff if we want to make a mistake, but we can't? That's, and you use the word can't. And for a lot of people, that's what they, that's what they feel. They feel like they can't make a mistake. You disappoint your parents. You would disappoint yourself because you think that success is having a two car garage, three bedroom house, two kids, this much money in the bank, that's how we define success. But if you talk to people who are 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, all of them had a dream. I, I, I bet almost everyone had a dream. They, they may be happy, they may not be happy, but all of them had a dream that they didn't do. Just about all of us. I still have a bucket list of things that I wanna do. And you don't want to be that person. When you get to the end of your life, and sometimes our lives are cut short, unfortunately, and you don't want to leave that card on the table. You don't want to wonder what if. I, I, I think we only get one life, and it's very, very short. It may seem long to you right now, but trust me, it, it goes by very quickly. And so, this idea of following a path, following the path of your parents or following the path of someone that you admire and, and, and not experimenting or trying different things. For some people, that's okay. You know, I shouldn't be so judgmental. There are some people who live a very, very simple life. It was a life determined, predetermined by their parents or by society, and that's fine. But you know, Henry, for myself, and maybe for you, or maybe for someone listening to this, you have a dream. You have a dream of doing something huge, big, dangerous. And the only way to get there is by accepting that mistakes are the pathway to that answer. There is, unless you win the lottery, and, and that's not making a mistake, you just get damn lucky. But any other way other than winning the lottery will take courage, overcoming doubt, hard work, learning, and lots and lots and lots of mistakes. That's how computers work. Even the smartest computer like Watson, you know, Google, Google sends out, when you put it, a, a search, something in the search engine, it sends out billions of hits on different websites all at one time. It makes a billions and billions of mistakes. So, and then what comes back, it doesn't send out the, the request to only one website or even 
30 websites and gets an answer back, it has to send it out to every single website saying, this is, do you have this word in it? And the answer is no. That's how great success is, is made. You've got to send out all of the different inquiries and get back the one or two nuggets of information. Well, and arrow, that's important. And actually, um, I do agree with that. So like, we got to try because one, you know, like it's your life, right? You don't have one times in this whole life. You got to change. You got to like, you know, you got to like do something that what you like to do rather than your family told you what should you do? Like get a job, get a, get into college and get a full score on SAT and then like have a, have a baby and want your baby doing like the same way like you did. So that's a pass. That's a routine. Can it make you like, in a stable square, you're gonna, you're not gonna change that, right? Like you need a life are special, unique, only you. So, um, so let's get into the second question, actually. So, um, do you think there's any common point between the mistakes made in music and the mistakes made in other areas? Yes, of course, because music is life, for me at least. There, I, I don't even like the word, I don't like delineating music from life. I don't even like the word art because I think art is life and life is art. Everything that we do is creative. The shirt that you're wearing today, that was a decision. That was a choice. And this is how I feel today. And, you know, I was just talking to someone about this yesterday is that we often put a, uh, a wall between being creative and art, meaning that, um, or and, and life, meaning there's a person who may work on cars or build houses. They say, oh, I'm not an artist. I'm not an artist. But if you look at them and what they do, the decisions they make and the pride they feel when they, when they fix something or create something, fixing and creating are very similar in my mind. That is the same human endeavor of creating and uh, creativity. So I think every single person in, their, in, their, in the world is creative and an artist. And so as a musician, as I'm playing a piece or conducting a piece and I'm choosing the wrong tempo or I do something technically that's not right and, 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 I want to, and I'm making a mental note, you know, to me, it's no different than the rest of my life. As I go into a grocery store and I choose this, or I'm watching TV and I choose that show, I don't really, um, as I get older, I don't really delineate the act of ex expression. Because right now I'm talking to you and I'm choosing from literally hundreds of thousands of words that are in my brain. And I'm, I'm editing and I'm changing and I'm evaluating and just to get, to get that expression. What I'm doing is music. <laughs> I'm being a musician right now, pacing myself, choosing a tempo, choosing a dynamic. And so um, for me, it, it, it's, it's all the same. It's not the same. I agree with you because I count myself as a musician, I think. Um, I started for playing saxophone, like being like, you know, like uh, when I was like nine years old, eight years old, something like that. And then I love piano, I love guitar. And I, I think all of instruments are just like a part of my life. I cannot, you know, live without them. So, um, so I made a lot of mistakes in on music areas. Like when I have a performance like I perform in front of people I made a mistakes and the only difference is, is like you know you made a mistakes but some of the audience they don't know you made a mistakes that's one of the points so like so so I know like I made a huge mistakes it's so embarrassing it's so awkward to me but there's like it's like still give you the best like recognition because some of them they don't really you know they cannot see the differences like that so I do like that yeah. You know, I, I often think that we as musicians are taught that the end goal is performance. Mm. But I think that's a false narrative. 
I, I do not think we learn instruments to perform. It, it, and, and I'm being honest with you. And having, having taught at some of the most prestigious universities and conservatories, I think this is the way that we train people, the, the students to think, but it's not. I, I'm here to say that the goal of music, the reason that Bach put pen to paper, yes, he may have written a piece of music to feed his family. Okay, I get that. But when you really look at the genius that's on the paper of Mozart and Bach and Beethoven, there's something more than paying their bills. And it's more than just giving a concert. They're, they're trying to connect with other human beings. They're trying to put out into the world something so beautiful that it, it, it makes their own hearts sing. And they wanna share that because otherwise they would just sit in a room and just write something down on a piece of paper and burn it because it was only for themselves. They're, and this is true with writers and painters and dancers, but even possibly you know, uh, politicians who wanna make the world a better place or chefs who wanna cook a great meal. In this music, the end goal is not perfection, but it's to touch another person's heart. If, if you, Henry, if you had a choice between giving a performance on your saxophone and saying, you made every note perfect, or you can make everyone laugh or, or cry. In I other choose, words, touch, touch their heart. I definitely choose the second one. So you definitely choose the second one. Yeah. But we don't teach music that way. Even on the highest level, Henry, which I think is a problem. We'll talk about this some other time, but it relates to the idea of mistakes. If, if you talk about mistakes, you have to talk about its opposite. What's the opposite of mistakes? Is it perfection? I don't think so. I think the opposite of mistakes is success. Now, success doesn't necessarily mean not making mistakes. Success means just you've reached your goal. And that's a big difference. That's a big, big difference. And as musicians, we're not taught to think about our goal, which is to make someone joyful or, or feel connected. There is no class, I can tell you, Henry, having been through music school and taught, there is no class in how to reach another person's soul. And that's a problem. That's a fundamental problem. So we need to remember that mistakes, remember that mistakes are not about not making mistakes. Mistakes are the bricks in the road to reach your goal. Every time when I hear that this, the music made by Michael Jackson, made by um, Beatles, I felt like, I don't know why, but I felt my heart is connect with them when I was listening to music. No matter it's like, you know, Billy Jim, no matter it's like, you know, Bated, every music like made by Michael Jackson, I just fall in love with, I don't know why. You know, that's so incredible. Well, you know, again, if you, if you talk to Paul McCartney or have you seen interviews with Michael Jackson or I've had, the, again, the pleasure of working with some really, even when I met Johnny Cash, um, there's something that, is common for all those people. And when you talk to them, there's a sense of wonderment. And, and, and you don't sense fear. This is, again, this is the commonality of all these great people that I've had the pleasure of meeting, either short or medium, or is that they're, they're in touch with the, as one musician has said, the art of possibility, meaning that there are, there's always a choice and there's always an answer. There's always an answer. And, and sometimes the answer doesn't come right now. And especially in our world that demands instant gratification. Now that I think it, it destroys the art of possibility because not everything can be figured out in 10 seconds. Not everything can be figured out in two minutes or in a day. 
sometimes the art of possibility and, and, and the brilliant choices that one make has to be digested. Sometimes it, it comes over decades. Wow, super good actually. And, and so uh, let's go into the uh, dessert question of this. Um, and so, so you have a unique transforming experience as I know, like from a musician to a conductor. And would you like to share with us some particular example of the mistakes you made as a musician and as a conductor? Well, as a musician, obviously, I, I, you know, if you want to call mistakes not playing something without, you know, intention, um, my my entire career as a musician was a series of mistakes. I rarely played something that I felt was completely the way that I intended it. Um, again, I, I don't think I all, I think I would have been a much better instrumentalist, both as a pianist and a clarinetist, if my goal was on perfection, which it was. I, I see as sometimes musicians who play with such ferocity and, and technical mastery over their instrument. And I learned later on that they were driven by passion. And if you're driven by passion, playing with perfection or, or playing with high technical mastery comes naturally because you're driven by a wonderful, passionate goal. But if you are driven into the practice room of just fixing your fourth finger, getting your tongue to tongue notes just the right way, that's no inspiration. There's no purpose in life to get your fourth finger to trill a little faster. That's, that's pointless. Had I ha had a greater inspiration, a vision of why I would have been a better, a better musician, I think. And that's the thing about being a conductor and the difference between being a conductor and instrumentalist is that as a conductor, the mistakes that we make are less obvious. So you, you, saw, you said about, you know, you were playing your saxophone on stage and no one could really necessarily tell that you made a mistake. Well, as a conductor, very rarely, does an audience hear your mistake? If, if you give a wrong cue and someone comes in wrong, people think, oh, it was that person's fault, not your fault. And, and I think it's one of the most dishonest things about being a conductor, mm. but it's the reality of being a conductor. So consequentially, conductors can make more mistakes and experiment more than an instrumentalist, which is good and bad, obviously. And one of the things that drives me nuts when I was playing in an ensemble is when a conductor made a mistake and they wouldn't admit it. They would say, oh, oh, oh okay, well, you know, let's stop here. And uh, okay, you, you missed a note here and whatever. I think conductors need to make more admissions to an ensemble because when you don't admit your mistakes, you're, 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 you're doing a couple things. You're, you're telling the group that you're not truthful with yourself, that mistakes are bad and you can't even admit it to yourself, which is really bad lesson for your musicians because they need to be able to make mistakes. They need to be able to take risks. And, and that's, uh, that's, don't get me started. That's another thing is that one of the toughest things that the conductor can do is to get an orchestra or a band to risk or a choir to risk, to really show who they are not just what they feel, but who they are as a person through their instrument. That's very, very difficult. As I conduct around the world and, and around the United States and working with some very high level young people, I see on their face perfection, but I don't see who they are. We all, we all look the same, <laughs> not just because we're Asian or whatever, but we all, hold our instruments in the perfect position and, and rarely, but once in a while, Henry, I see, do you ever, you ever go to an orchestra or band or, or ensemble Absolutely. and you see that one or two people who are just themselves on stage? 
they're not just good obeying students, but th th they're enjoying themselves. They somehow are like a mutant and they've, they've, they've discovered the, the, the core of joy. Yeah. And that's so wonderful to see because that joy is like a light in the middle of the night. And that no matter what a, a classroom system does, they, the, the power of the life this force inside of them is so bright that you cannot turn it off. You know, you, you kind of have that, Henry. You're, you're, you're energetic and you're joyful. I can see that. You're, I mean, it doesn't mean that you don't get sad, but I can see your life force. And as when you're teaching music, you have to use that life force inside of Henry. There's so many times I've seen people who play music in a kind of detached way, yeah. but then when they put the instrument down, and they, they're in the, in the main quad area of the school, they're laughing and they're jumping around and they're joking and, you know, they're a completely different person Hold than on. when they're holding the instrument. It's like night and day, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I think our goal as music teachers, but also as musicians for ourselves, is to unite those two people. And that's why when you see someone like Yo-Yo Ma play cello, you feel like you are seeing exactly who he is. But there's other musicians that I see that I, I really don't know who you are. You're playing well, but I don't know what you believe. I don't know what your joys are. I don't know what your fears are. I don't, know, I don't see who you are through this instrument, which is sad. It's like wearing a, can you imagine, if, Henry, if you went through your entire life and you had to wear a Halloween mask your entire life? Or every time you played the saxophone, you had to wear a mask so no one could see who was playing the saxophone? That's important. I like the feeling when I, um, so like actually when I watch into some movie, so exact, uh, for example, like Green Book. So the feeling when um, the people like in the bar, when they play the music, that's the feeling I like it most because they're happy, they're laughing, they really enjoy the music when they play, play them blues, jazz, that's exactly what I like. Like they're oh, no, 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 no. like so good. I like that feeling, you know, like they're enjoying the music rather than just perform like, you know, a basic, like, you know, a routine like that. I well, love can, can, can I say something? Because you're absolutely right. You are yeah. absolutely right. And that's why people are drawn to pop music. And that's why people are drawn to rock music. And that's why Lady Gaga is one of the most influential performers because you can sense who she is she's laying it on stage the the thing is that there are classical musicians like that people like yo-yo or people like lang lang or people like um, joshua bell that you, oh, you, you wow. feel like you are watching something extraordinary happening in front of you someone's really bearing their soul to you if we know this and you, you saw this in my video about joy definitely if we know this that this makes people excited like Henry, and like a lot of other people like you, that they're drawn to seeing the humanity. Can we teach it? Can we make that an integral part of our music education? Not perfection, but that sense of joy. And, and you know my feelings about it, but I, 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 I agree with you on this point. Wow, I just can't, you know, I just love that when I, especially when I saw them are happy or enjoying the music. I love that feeling so much. I haven't seen, you know, even a once, like when I, uh, you know, on a, like, see any performer, like they felt happy because it's really to say that. So like, I love that feeling when they really enjoy the music. And um, so what have the, what have some of the consequences been when you make mistakes as a musician and also as a conductor? Because the consequences must be different. Well, mistakes have different influences on people and certainly on me as well. I mean, I have made some whoppers of mistakes and um, I tend to be very hard on myself. I think my, I think my team knows that um, and I certainly know it. I can be extremely critical. There's a certain point where that's healthy where sometimes your mistakes can harm other people or harm an organization. And it's a mistake that needs to stick in your mind. It needs to never, ever happen again. And so, the, so that, you know, that's how it's influenced me. It's, it's, it's helped me be a better person and a better leader and a better conductor. 
Um, but there are times where I have made mistakes and I, uh, it, it may have closed doors. For, for example, as a classical musician, we don't improvise very well at all. We're not taught to improvise like a jazz musician or some rock musicians, which is a sad, sad thing. Even, even Mozart and Beethoven, the greatest composers, classical composers, improvised. And it's something we just don't teach for the most part, for the most part. And had I had I had the courage to learn to improvise and experiment with improvising, I would be a much stronger musician right now. My ear would be better. My imagination would be better. My communication would be better. And so I think those are those are cases where you know mistakes have shut doors and and built walls, and that's that's not good. So I guess what I'm saying is that I think they're good mistakes, and and there are bad mistakes, and and maybe we shouldn't call them both mistakes. Maybe maybe it's too confusing because sometimes people don't know the, the difference between good mistakes and bad mistakes. Um, because there are good mistakes and we need, to, you, it, it's, it's an oxymoron. It's like jumbo shrimp, that's an oxymoron. And you know, maybe we should find a new word for good mistakes. I mean, we, we, experimentation. Um, uh, inspiration, everything like that. <laughs> yeah, but I think, I think whatever, word, whatever word we come up with, we should embrace it and we should make it a powerful tool. We should not hide it. We should not confuse it with bad mistakes. We, we need to we need to do more of that good mistake, whatever we call it. I, I don't I just don't like that word mistake. <laughs> it's like a slap on the hand. Exactly. So like when you call it a mistake, it just looks like like you don't want to embrace it. So if you change a word to some like words like positive meaning, and then it means like you want to embrace this one. You want to like really like you want to learn something from it rather than you know get get, get away from it. Good mistakes, whatever we call it, are are the path path to happiness, to success, to progress, to joy. You know. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's very it's very popular, and, and I love the I love I love what you're calling this show or this this blog. You know, you're calling it good mistakes. Is that what you're calling it, or good mistakes? Yeah, good mistakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, I mean, I, like, I definitely agree with that. Because, like, for example, like Steve Jobs, I, I'm Mark Zuckerberg, and all the story about them, like biography about them. Like, if they don't have any setback before they succeed, like, the life is so like monotonous, so boring. Like, you know, you you never made any like problem in your past for going to succeed, and it was so like. Like you know, like plan. That's not the life you want to guess. So, as a personal like standpoint of myself, I want to make mistakes as much as possible. Cause I'm the life. I'm the period in this like seventeen period, which is like I'm able to make more. I am able to learn more from it. You know, like so I wanted to make mistakes. That's that's a great point, and that's what I wanted. Like telling the people from the school, telling the people from outside, like embrace this just embrace the mistakes. Like you said, like, don't hit them. That's important. And um, actually like, so um, it's, it's took a long time right now. Cause I, it's like, I thought it was like 30 minutes, something like that. So is any bother to you or not? Cause I know you're busy, so. No, that's okay. I'm enjoying it. Oh, I'm enjoying talking with you so much. Seriously, oh my gosh. And I, I'm, I'm a non-native speaker actually. I'm, I'm come from China, I come from Beijing. And then like, I, um, I live in this country for like one years like that, one years in, you know, one years and a half like that. And um, I was living in LA before. So, you know, that's a common point between us. Like I was- Oh yeah, LA. my Los Angeles connection. Yeah. But see, you know, th this is really interesting because, you know, you're from Beijing, of course, you know, huge city. And people from America look at Chinese and Korean, people as being very monolithic and 
because China is a communist country, they think that um, that all people have to be the same. But I think what you are an example of, because you're full of energy and you're full of life, and you but you grew up in Beijing, is that um, there are a lot of Chinese people who are very different from each other, who have lots of personality and have lots of ideas of thinking, lots of, of human um, inquisitiveness. And I don't think, uh, I, what, what I, what I and, and you know what I'm talking about in terms of this Asian culture of, you know, in, especially in China and Korea, and, and other Asian countries, there's a very strong kind of a, a cultural expectation to a point where young people are committing suicide and, and because they feel the pressure of, of success and getting into good school and all this other stuff. But I have faith that there are people like you in China, across the world, who are hungry to find a different truth, who are waking up and discovering, this is a great thing about the internet, discovering alternate realities that are not the way that just, the, the, the way that the government says, or the way that schools say, or the way that you know people around you say, there are other ways of living. And I think we're, what we're gonna see over the next decade or so is a, a very radical way of young people living and making decisions. So I think I think even within the next ten years, you're going to see a big drop away from going to universities. And I know that sounds really hard to understand, but just as the way that Uber has changed the whole transportation paradigm, just the way that Amazon has changed the the retail paradigm, I think education and even the performing arts are going to go through a radical change. And that the way that people learn and the value of what a degree will be compared to what you can do, because you don't get a degree to get a degree. People now get a degree to, to, to get a better job, right? Yeah, I don't like that. But if you can, but if enough millions of people get a job and, and make a, a good enough living without a degree, which you're starting to see, you're seeing, especially after the pandemic, people are dropping out of universities. And, you know, again, look at Steve Jobs, look at Bill Gates, and look at a lot of people who, who left university paradigm to do something big. You know, I, I don't think it's just going to be the billionaires who leave the traditional thinking. I think more and more people are going to be finding alternative ways to educate themselves. That's going to be a huge problem to the society because, like, so if the traditional education, the the economic is going to, you know, drop out from the, you know, put them in a bind because no people like studying the college more, and then like, it's going to be a, as what you say, it's going to be a, like, uh, it could, it, it's good for all the people, but it's not good for the college, it's not good for the university because you know the 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 tuition, the stuff like the the support are getting less and less, so. I mean, yeah, yeah. That, that whole model of tuition of spending seventy thousand dollars is really left over from the nineteen forties, you know, in, in, or even earlier than that. This idea of having money and, and the only way to access is to for the family to sacrifice or for the kid to work th themselves to death to try to get a scholarship and hope and pray everything is on. It's kind of like trying to get into the NBA. It's really knowledge should not be a lottery. Knowledge should not should not be privileged to, for only the few, few people who can afford it. Knowledge should be like clean drinking water, clean air. It should be the right of every person who wants to learn anything. It should not be uh, elitist. And, and I think that's where the next thing, that's where the next uh, radical revolution will happen, where you can learn calculus and not have to spend a penny for it. I can learn on YouTube right now how to take apart a car and put, to, put it back together again. And I don't have to go to a mechanic school to pay for it. Exactly, exactly. Oh my gosh. A lot of people, they used like one year to finish their whole um, 
like study, uh, like some somebody somebody went to the Harvard, somebody went to the MIT. So it's a guy like who um who like have a talk on the TED and then like share the experience. Like he never been to the Harvard, but he used one years to finish all of the work from Harvard, in online, and which means like it could be faster, the way faster than you know you expected. We are. Like I said, we are on the precipice of a radical, radical revolution. It, 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 it's, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting and scary because if everything becomes online and that we're ordering Uber Eats online and we're ordering clothes online, there's no reason to connect with human beings anymore. And so that's the one price that I'm, I'm concerned about. Me too. Is that if people are on their video games and going down black holes through YouTube, spending their entire lives in virtual reality and educating themselves and, you know, and, and raising virtual families, why, why exist in this world? I don't have an answer to that completely, but that's the next Actually, that's a, that's a question for your generation. Exactly, because when I'm texting you, like, sort of the message, like, I don't know your emotion in the in the you know in this tense, because like we're through the virtual like world, it's like 3D. We don't know what's going on, like what you what you've been, what, what you've done. But um, if you talk like like this, even though like it's virtual, but I know your eyes, I know your feeling, I know your face, what you want to show me. So that's one of the points we're gonna improve, even though like we're studying this online virtual world. That's one of the important questions to us, to this generation. And, and that's why it's important in life to be a, a big thinker, thinker, not just in intelligent, but deep. Because with all the smart people that are in the world today and they're living in Silicon Valley, I feel like we're, paint, we're they're building walls and we're building walls around ourselves, and we don't see it. Everyone's interested in making money and making sure your app is, is, is the, you know, the next hot thing but we're destroying our humanity in the race to make more money and to be more successful. And in the end, Henry, you know, in, in, in the, on the day, someday, maybe you'll have your own child and you hold your baby in front of you and you will realize that this baby is the most important thing in the entire world, more than anything else. And it will change your perspective. I mean, maybe you're wise enough to understand that right now, but just as just as we're killing our planet, and just as we're killing each other, we um, we've done this to ourselves. There's no bird or no 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 bug on the planet that are make they're making us destroy ourselves. And so, I mean, this is off the topic a little bit, but. You know, I, 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 really, I really hope that your generation discovers its humanity and help and, 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 and changes the course and wakes up and helps wake us up because we've not done a very good job up to this point. So actually, here's the, the last point. And so uh, after this, I, I'm not going to, you know, wish you more time for, you know, but this, here's the last point. So like if you the only advantage, the benefit like you, you're going to have from going to harvard and like mit for example i think is the resources the peers uh the qualification the um uh like for example like if you went to harvard the professor the friend you're talking with the people you hang out with usually and they're like in that level so that's why you want to go into the the harvard in that in some particular reason right so because you're going to have more resources more like like that kind of but that's but that's still wrong if, if there's a brilliant economics professor or law professor at Harvard, this is the analogy that I use, is that if you have a vaccine to COVID, do you think it should only be available to the people who can afford it? Of course not. And that's why the vaccine is free. That's why the polio vaccine is for free. That's why the flu vaccine is generally for free, even though insurance agents, uh, companies will pay for it. But right now, the U.S. government, for the most part, is paying for it. But we pay through it for our, our taxes. But the idea is that if it saves lives, we have a moral obligation to inoculate everyone. 
if there is a brilliant economics professor whose knowledge, if disseminated to the entire world, could help solve poverty, or if there is a great law professor whose great knowledge could help solve injustice, do we not have a more, doesn't Harvard, Yale have a moral obligation? I'm not talking financial obligation, but doesn't it have a moral obligation to make that knowledge available to every man, woman, and child? The answer is yes. I think the answer is yes. So this is why I think universities, and I think to a certain extent concert halls, are old thinking and inherently classist, supremacist, where there's a lot of discussion now. People are using the word supremacy a lot in a lot of different ways, racial supremacy, economic supremacy. But I also think that there's intellectual supremacy. And this is why I think you're going to see the, 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 uh, the, the, the peasants, the proletariat knocking on the doors of all of these institutions that have walls around them. And, and like NYU and other universities that now has made medical school free, they, they made that decision, that courageous that, that decision, it's along with that co-founder from Home Depot. They said, great medicine should not cost. And training a great doctor should not cost. I love that. I love it. So I think that's true with anything, with, with knowledge in general. If you, if you go down that slippery slope and you say, you know, we should teach all, all doctors for free so they go out and they heal the world, that's got to be true for all knowledge. And, and that's why the internet, that's your... I didn't have the internet when I was growing up your age. The internet is the great democratizer. We need to broaden it. We need to, we need to make it even more powerful. Wow, super good. I mean, we do have a great conversation. Um, again, like, um, thank you for, um, you know, talk with me in this period. And then like, what a pleasure to talk with you again.